Hello, MCM Glasgow. How are we again? I like it. We're here with Simon Fisher Becker of Harry Potter and Doctor Who. Uh, so, how are you, sir? I'm, I'm just you. Unlike my microphone. Microphone's down. Microphone's down. <laughs> Mic is down. Let's have a look, Simon. The light's on. Light's on. But it's not green. Mic down. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Uh, I'm at the tail end of whatever man flu is, so I apologise for my Orson Welles impersonation today. But uh, anyway, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for coming. All right, so um, have you seen like, any Dorian or Friar cosplays around or anything like that? So have I seen any uh, uh, Dorian? Uh, I haven't seen any Fat Friars unless you count Anne Widdicombe. <laughs> Obviously, she disapproved of that comment. <laughs> <coughs> no, when I was first put into the uh, Fat Friar costume, um, Anne Widdicombe was a sort of black hair or brunette hair, but they put this blonde wig, and I remember saying, my God, I look like a blonde Anne Widdicombe. I didn't know I was a you know, uh, telling the future of the Oracle. Um, um, uh, Dorian, yes, I have seen a few. Yeah. I have seen a few. Um, and the irony is, that I'm, I think contractually, I'm not allowed to dress up as Dorian oh, no, unless I really? get written permission. But I can have photographs with other people dressed up as Dorian. <laughs> so, <laughs> ironies of life. That's it. Yeah. So, um, Dorian's a black market trader. What drew you to Dorian? Like what to drew me to, yeah, to like the part? Uh, what drew me to the part? Um, well, it was the fact I was asked to go to an audition, if I'm absolutely oh, okay, honest. Okay, fair enough. No, I, I didn't choose to. But having said that, I couldn't written a better part for myself. No, it was you know. So yeah, I was one of seven roly poly actors who went for an audition. Yeah. And was the lucky one that they chose. All oh, right. So did you have like any kind of like input in the look of Dorian? Uh, yes, um, I can say that um, when I went to the costume place um, uh, Angels in Hendon okay um, they'd got the main outfit the frock yeah and I was looking in the in the in the long mirror and I was asked is there anything else do you think that Doran would wear yeah and I just said I think he might have a bit of bling <laughs> so they produced yeah. this box that had lots of rings and things yeah. and then there was another box and just out of one corner there was this chain with one half crescent on it oh, all right and uh, and I said, oh, let's have a look at that. And of course, he was then like a magician's scarf. As you pulled this chain, he got longer and longer and longer and longer. So in the end, they wrapped it around me about five times. And it wasn't until we did A Good Man Goes to War okay. that uh, then the Moldavarian, the, the sort of logo yeah. for the Moldavarian, is the half crescent. Okay. So I like to think I had some input Had there. the input in the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, I no. like to think that, yeah. So, did you know what kind of personality you wanted for Dorian when you was kind of, you know, kind of, maybe yeah. not researching, but kind of getting into the role? Yeah. Of when, um, and any writers out there, uh, always keep um, the descriptions of you want brief, so the actor can really grasp quickly yeah. what you're looking for. Uh, and when I did the audition, the audition basically was the scene with Dr. Song. Right? And it, it just said, set homage to Star Wars. Yeah. So I knew roughly what it was going to look like. Dorian, large blue man, think Sydney Green Street. Right. And for those who don't know, Sydney Green Street was a large actor who was in a film called Casablanca, where he wore a white suit and a red fez. And he basically was the black marketeer in All the story right. of Casablanca. So I knew exactly uh, what they were looking for in that sense. I couldn't do an impersonation of uh, no. Sidney Greenstreet, but <laughs> he being a large man, he always was very still in his okay. scenes. So I thought that's what I'll keep. And of course, being still gives a character gravitas. And I think that's what intrigues people. So yeah. I, I, I can't say I spent hours and hours dwelling on yeah. it. It was just a simple instruction, think Sidney Greenstreet. And you kind of just brought and, and that just the brought it in very yeah. quickly. Yeah. All right. So, um, do you feel like Dorian had any other tendencies apart from helping the doctor and 
maybe? Or do, do you think? Well, I, I suppose ultimately, it's it, it, he makes no decision unless he benefits from it. Yeah. Um, but at his core, I think he probably is quite a decent chap. Yeah, he comes across as that. Yeah, uh, uh, but um, where he differs from the doctor, if to do the right thing, you have to do a nasty thing. The doctor would have angst over it, whereas Doran would just say, "Well, it's the right thing. Get on with it." <laughs> yeah, that's that's the difference. So, yeah. a bit of a spoiler. I mean, Dor Dorian was beheaded, wasn't he, by the uh, headless monks? He was indeed. Um, <coughs> he believed he, that, that they were his friends. Uh, do you feel? Did you feel like this? That would happen, should I say, in the story as as it unravelled? Did you feel that would happen to Dorian? Well, no. When I first read the script and I heard that that happened, I thought, "Oh, that's a shame." Yeah. Because I didn't think I thought that was the end of Dorian, and then I thought, well, maybe if I'm lucky, there'll be a backstory. Yeah. Right. Um, but on reflection now, thinking yeah. about it, I think Dorian potentially thought that might be the worst case scenario. Okay. Yeah. But because later on, yeah, there's the discussion about doing deals with the yeah. with the headless monks. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And so some get to stay in a box. Oh, okay. It's because Dorian's wealthy. He was able to do a deal with that. Okay, cut my head off, but keep me alive in a box. But I didn't know that at the time, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Dorian complains a lot during the last kind of things we see of him and stuff in the box. Um, do you still reckon he's probably still complaining now? Oh, well, he's an ultimate complainer because he plays on the card that if you whinge enough, people will do what you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Law of attraction. Well, no, no, no. no. Some carry people, on. I mean, some kids learn very quickly. If yeah. they whinge yeah. long enough, you'll give in. Yeah. You see, so, yeah. Um, so, so he's kept that trait. Do you think we'll see any of him in the future? I'm absolutely certain we will, but when, I have no idea. The, the fan following is very strong. It is and very there's, strong. And I know there's um, a guy called Grant who does a cartoon strip. And he's introduced Dorium into the cartoon strip. Oh, wow. And recently, Titan uh, produced a little Dorium figure. So the interest is still out there. All oh, right. And you'll be interested in obviously carrying oh, on. Oh, yeah. I've, I've made it very clear that if um, they want to re uh, bring Dorium back and they'd like me to continue, I'd be more than happy to. In your, in your head, would, what would you like Dorian to be kind of carrying on doing, would you say? Or what would you like him to maybe helping or...? <laughs> Well, ultimately, we do need to know what Dorian's debt is. Yep, definitely. And I have no idea, really. Uh, I, the doctor must have helped Dorian out yeah. in some sort of way. And uh, I, I think uh, maybe Dorian, at some point in history, uh, he was a sort of Schindler character that he needed to and wanted to rescue either nations or many peoples okay. or people from a planet that was going to but it all got out of hand it yeah. was a bit too much for him to do and that's when he begged the doctor that's what yeah. i think yeah. might be the case because after all the tardis can hold a whole galaxy can yeah it? that's it and um but it might be something very trivial it we just be. don't know yeah. <laughs> um what i can tell you in an, in the first draft of um the first draft of uh, A Good Man Goes to War. There's a reference to Dorham's mother. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, and it's, but it's not mentioned. And Dorham's mother is a composer. And she, she wrote the attack prayer that oh. he refers to. So, so uh, it makes me think, is Dorham uh, musical in any way? Yeah. He'd probably play the tuba. I could say I, it'd be very either musical. that, conversely, he'd play the piccolo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or he'd probably be a conductor. Yeah. Yes. That's because he does manipulate everything that's around him anyway. That's it. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, that's uh, you know, there, and the wonderful thing with Doctor Who, anything is possible. And it's open to discussion across so many communities. Yes. So such a big community, should I say? Yeah. And and I know worldwide now because because this strange phenomenon of conventions, yeah. I get to travel the world. I'm asked some of the questions are the same, but I'm always asked very uh, unusual questions as well. Yeah. But basically, everybody wants to know 
more about Torium. Yeah. So that's why I think he, he will come back. It'd be nice to get a bit more of a backstory as well as obviously seeing him more in the future. It would be nice. I mean, I'm yeah. talking very selfishly yeah. now that there, <laughs> are, that there is a Dorium spin-off. Yeah, that'd be good. Know, Dorium's <laughs> deals. <laughs> you know. Like a storage <laughs> wars kind of yeah. thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. But um, uh, even, or just the occasional one-off. Yeah. Well, you can't have an occasional one-off, can you? You can have just... Coming back for Christmas specials. Specials. And yeah, specials. That's, That's what they call yeah. them, don't they? Specials. Yeah. Specials. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go on to Harry Potter. You played the Fat Friar. Yes. Um, did you read any of the books before you kind of went in for, say, the audition? Or I have to confess, I hadn't. Oh. Um, and but and the um, audition came up. And for those of you who don't know, auditions can come up very quickly. So this was two o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. And my first interview was at ten o'clock the following morning. Oh. By chance, about three months before this. Yeah. I was in a bookshop and there was one of those buy th three for the price of two. Yeah, three for two. Yeah. And I got my two. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, what can I have as my third? And just out of the corner of my eye, on a shelf all by itself, yeah. was this one copy of The Philosopher's Stone. Wow. And I remember saying, oh, well, let's take that and see what all this yeah. fuss is about. Because for some reason, Harry Potter didn't grab my imagination immediately. Okay. I admit that. Um, so it, it sat on my shelf for three months. Oh. <laughs> um, but then there's a friend of mine is a Harry Potter anorak. Okay. So I phoned her up. I said, I'm in a sheer panic. I've got an audition for Harry Potter. Oh. And, and it's for the Fat Friar. Well, not only was she able to tell me who the Fat Friar was, but she was able to tell me what page he oh. first appears on in the book. So page 37, apparently. Did you go straight to the so page? So I went straight to the page, read, read, read. And then I read the first chapter. And I will admit, it took me three chapters before I was then Grasp, ho hooked yeah. in. So I've now read all the books. Oh, wow. So, so, and, it was, and it was an exciting time. Um, and uh, there were, I think there were about 20 of us they saw originally. Really? Mm. And the first question I was asked was, have you read the book? Yeah. And uh, my answer was, oh, I know exactly who the Fat Friar is. Yeah. So that's how I sidestepped that one. But um, anyway, so it got whittled down. And in the end, it was four interviews. I was then offered the role. We then did five weeks filming, uh, filming ev all sorts of things, including the death day party yeah. and scenes with Peeves, the poltergeist. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, none of it was used. Oh. None of it was used. And, uh, but I hang on at the sorting ceremony yeah. for about 10 seconds. And I sort of joke now that my name in the credits is on screen longer than I am. Oh, no. Yeah. But anyway, so that's my story. But then, of course, 10 years later, I get yeah. Doctor Who. I come to these things. Yeah. And um, then the um, this little girl came along with two copies of a photograph, which was clearly taken from the telly. Okay. And that's the photograph I sell now. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it all so comes back round. The community, I mean, Harry Potter community is just as big as the Doctor Who, you know, so... But it's amazing what the fans oh. find out about you. They do. I mean, I've learned a lot about myself in the last <laughs> six years. I'm, 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 to be honest, it's true, but I've just completely forgotten about it. Yeah. So, one last question before we wrap up, <coughs> Simon. Yes. Um, what was the most fun you had on the set of The Philosopher's Stone? Well, there's two different types of fun. Okay. The most exciting thing is meeting or seeing the good and the great who are in the movies and being in the same sort of green room or, or makeup bus okay. yeah. as the likes of Zoe Wanamaker, uh, Richard Harris. I said, they, they, the costumes for the ghosts were very stiff okay. and difficult, and so they moved us around on golfing buggies. Oh, right. And so we just moved from one place, and the studios were huge, you know. You move around, and we're going down one corridor, and there was Richard Harris. And, um, and as, as I passed, I went, good morning, and he went, morning, <laughs> morning. Uh, so that was my sole conversation <laughs> with Richard Harris. But it was really good fun. Um, then on the professional side of things, or physical side of things, it was very much like this, hanging 20 feet off the floor. And uh, it's only then I become very conscious of my weight, oh. and the and the the stunt people were very good. They yeah. reassured. 
absolutely reassured me that this system could carry a tank. Right. right. And then when I watched the guy lift me up, it literally was with one finger, the way the mechanism and the pulleys work. He just literally would just went like that, you know. <laughs> and I went, woo! Yeah. Right. And then the funniest part is, um, you see me in the year philosophers, so come flying out the floor. Oh, yeah. Well, that was done with me on a seesaw. So right. they sat me on a seesaw with my head back, with all the blood rushing to my head. Somebody stack, uh, stuck the um, um, mug in yeah. my hand. And then when they went action, they swung the seesaw up. And then, you come and, up. The, and then I had to do a few things. So that was very funny. Oh. Yeah. Well, Simon, thank you very much. It wasn't long enough. I had loads here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I talk too much no, anyway. No, that's no problem. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, so you guys at home, remember, if you like this interview, please give us a thumbs up. Remember to subscribe. <laughs> it's MYM Buzz. Um, thank you very much again, Simon Fisher-Baker. A round of applause, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. And it's Simon Fisher Becker. Becker. <laughs> Not that I'm fussy. No. <laughs> but I don't want Simon Fisher Baker to Baker, get my no. royalty check, do I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Again, I apologise. Thank you very much. Remember, guys, we've got more Bean Boozle challenges. And coming up next, we have the Hillywood Girls. Thank you very much. See you soon. Okay, bye. I 
try to be strong, but I can't carry you on my own. Another able to do it all alone. Asking for assistance, you just left for someone else. I'll get an answer to see if I can prove myself. And often feel it in my bones Oh, I I Don't think that I can let this go It circles in my head I'm thinking paranoid I can't seem to get rid of this undying noise It dwells in my thoughts From the front and back I 
time to start to get myself right back on track oh, oh. Can you hear the sound of the drums Beating in my head at night Can you hear the thunder come Rolling in the naked sky It drums until the very end Loud into the morning light I don't wanna miss this now Living in the night life Started feeling rather weak And I I Can never seem to fall asleep My nights are days and my days are nights Even when I try to turn off the lights It's in my head the never ending beat Something was wrong, I'm feeling incomplete oh, oh. Can you hear the sound of the drums Beating in my head at night Can you hear the thunder come Rolling in the naked sky It drums until the very end Loud into the morning light I don't want to miss this now Living in the night life I don't know if this is something that I can control Please someone help me and save me from the drum roll I know that this is something that I can control Please someone help me and save me from the drum roll Can you hear the sound of the drums Beating in my head at night Can you hear the thunder come Rolling in the naked sky It drums until the very end Loud into the morning light I don't want to miss this now Living in the night life Feels alright. Oh yeah. 
some say some cause she's not worth it But I think that she's perfect No one knows how she makes me happy I'm always hers and I always will be Six months is a pretty short time But I can't get you off my mind Spend the night going up in bed I remember every word she said Let's stay Be so real. I won't go and stay Just stay so much. I'll go do a new one. I'll do a new one. Test, 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 one, 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 one. Hello. One, 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 two, two, three. One, 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 two, two, one, one. One, 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 two, two, one, one. Hello. Hello, MCM Glasgow. How are we? Oh, again. Hi, MCM Glasgow. How are we? Good. So we've got the Hillywood Show girls coming up on this stage next. We're going to play you a couple of their parodies, and then we're going to get straight into an interview with them. So thank you very much, guys. Stay tuned.
keep telling them I'm fine And that's what they don't see That's what they don't see I'm killing on my own I make the moves up as I go And that's what they don't know That's what they don't know But I keep cruising Shake, 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 shake,